Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ryan Katowski. I'm the chair of Arlington's Clean Energy Future Committee. I'm also a labs engineer, so this kind of stuff gets me kind of excited. Um, I'm just here to say hello, welcome you. I'm very excited to hear more about the project just like you are. Uh, we're going to be talking about ground source heat pumps and network geothermal, and it's an important part of uh, plans to electrify buildings as we work towards our 2050 net zero greenhouse gas goal in town. So I'm just here to say hello, really glad to see you, and I'm going to turn it over to um, Arlington Sustainability Manager, Talia Fox, who's going to MC the evening. Thank you, Ryan. So welcome, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Is that good? Okay. Um, so if you don't know me, I'm Talia. I'm the Sustainability Manager for the town. Um, thanks to everybody who helped make this event possible tonight. Um, a special thanks to our uh, rancher for this project, Heat. We have a representative here who will be sharing more later from Heat. Um, and thanks to the many volunteers and staff who helped uh, flyer the neighborhood. So if you arrived here because there was a flyer on your door, you can thank some volunteers. Um, so tonight we're going to be exploring a technology known as networked geothermal, what it is and why it matters in Massachusetts, how it fits into our work to mitigate climate change in Arlington, and how we're approaching studying its feasibility right here in East Arlington. Those very simple topics should take us just about 45 minutes, at which point you can Take some time to roam around the room if you haven't yet, get some snacks, generously provided by Foodlink. Um, check out the posters with the interactive activities. Our uh, lovely uh, Lego model of a network geothermal system back there is pretty cool to check out, thanks to our student fellow Zoe. Um, and then we'll come back for Q&A. <coughs> realizing I should be on the agenda slide. We'll come back for Q&A around 8, um, and then we'll have some question and answer with our presenters and guests and get you out of here by 8.30. Um, you'll notice there are some question boxes, both at check-in and in the table, at the table in the back over there. Please uh, submit your questions. We'll also give you an opportunity to ask questions aloud during the Q&A, but we'll select some from the box as well uh, if you feel more comfortable submitting your question that way. All right. So just as a refresher, burning fossil fuels produces greenhouse gases, which are causing climate change. And in order to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and achieve the town's goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, we have to shift from using fossil fuels in our homes and in our vehicles to using clean electricity. We're going to zoom in on buildings today because we're focused on a technology that heats and cools buildings. But another reason is because the bulk of emissions in Arlington come from buildings, 60%. And 75 of those emissions come from the on-site burning of fossil fuels, of specifically natural gas and fuel oil, in our homes to keep us warm. And we have to transition away from these fuels if we're going to achieve the town's goal. The town's net zero action plan has a priority action that involves advocating for phasing out the natural gas system. The map to the right on the screen displays the many gas leaks in our community that are contributing to emissions here. It's so about 7% of emissions are from natural gas leaks, according to our 2017 inventory. And I believe that number is actually higher than some more recent data. The Net Zero Action Plan also has a priority action that involves piloting neighborhood scale ground source heat pump projects, also known as network geothermal. And as we'll hear shortly, these projects can specifically help us address the transition away from gas and toward a clean electricity future. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Andrew from Heat. Thanks so much, Kelly. I'm Andrew Eilith. Uh, I work at Heat. We're a Boston-based climate nonprofit um, that has worked on a range of different kind of climate problems and solutions over the years, um, including gas leaks. And over the last few years, has really focused on network geothermal. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. One thing we like to point out is that Heat never takes money from any industry. That's gas, geo, any of the industries. We are fiercely um, protective of our independence. We see this as an equity and clean energy transition model that is really important that we be able to sort of speak clearly and, and fact-based. All right. So Talia gave a great overview of kind of why we're here talking about this. We, the Arlington has net zero goals 
to get away from fossil fuels. We currently heat our homes and buildings with uh, combusting fossil fuels. The good news is we have a solution to this. We have energy efficient heat pumps and renewable electricity. But that's not the whole story. This is a graph showing electrical demand in the United States over the course of an entire year. And what you see in the middle there, helpfully labeled, is the summer peak. That's when everyone who has air conditioning turns on their air conditioning. And that's the greatest demand on our electrical system. The trouble is, if we move from using electricity just primarily for cooling in our buildings and switch from burning fossil fuels to heat our buildings, to heating our buildings with electricity, that all changes. So this is a graph that we like to call the falcon curve. Uh, you see that falcon flying at you. So this, is, this maps out different scenarios for what happens to that peak electrical demand over the course of a year with the, using different technologies. So that red line is using electric baseball heating, which has a coefficient of performance of one, meaning that for each unit of energy you put into the system, you get one unit of heating. If we use air source heat pumps, which are awesome, we love the air source heat pumps, you get some of an annual coefficient of performance of two, that's that blue line. If you move to ground source heat pumps, you get that green line. Why? Because our air source heat pumps have to work hard when you need them most. When it's really hot outside and they're trying to cool you inside, they have to work hard to extract all the heat from your building, and the reverse is true in winter. And when you use network geothermal, you get that purple line. So we, quote, we talk about an annual coefficient of performance of around six. The, there's a system in, like this in Colorado Mason University that has a winter coefficient of performance of 8.9. And it's just unprecedented efficiency. Why? Let's talk a bit about that. First, right, so this is, there's a lot of diagrams around it. I cannot recommend highly enough the Lego model at the back. Please take time to go check it out. On the right, you can see a basic model of an individual ground source heat pump. So this is a technology that has been in use for many, many years, um, where you see a set of four holes running to a heat pump in the house. <clears throat> Oak Ridge National Lab, at the top there, studied what would happen to electrical demand if there was widespread use of this, of this technology. Not networked geothermal, but just ground source heat pumps. And they find it saves a trillion dollars, trillion dollars in electrical grid build out. And it's, yeah, I mean, you can see the figures here. A huge amount of carbon mitigation, 30 billion less in transmission lines. I think it's around 40,000 miles of transmission lines. So the poor, oh, there it is, 34,500 miles of transmission lines that we don't need. So the, it, the point here is this is just much more efficient as we seek to electrify everything in our buildings. So efficiency matters. Talia gave you a map of gas leaks in Arlington. This is gas leaks, like gas leaks in Boston. Boston has some of the oldest gas infrastructure in the country. It's a real problem. It's a problem because it leaks and there are, and there are concerns about safety. It's also a problem because fixing those leaks turns out to be incredibly expensive. And because the usable life of gas pipeline, the new gas pipeline is around 60 years, we will be paying off those new gas pipelines for decades, and decades past the net zero goals of 2050. They're essentially, these new gas lines are stranded assets, assets that we're not gonna use for their full life. Another challenge with uh, alternative approaches to decarbonizing buildings is what people refer to as the utility death spiral. Some people call it the last grandma problem, which is, if you look at this picture, so this is, the idea is this is a neighborhood where people have started to switch off the gas system and electrify their homes one at a time, probably with air source heat pumps, but it could be ground source heat pumps also. So a couple up there on the top left have done it, a few over there on the right, but their neighbors haven't. And there's a lot of, there could be a lot of reasons for that. It's expensive to electrify. They might be renters who, aren't, who don't pay for the infrastructure in their homes. And what happens as you do that is that those who don't leave the gas system are left carrying the car, the fixed car, of that gas system. 
and costs get higher and higher. And as those costs get higher, more people will exit the gas system, and that's that utility debt spiral, where the people least able to electrify are left with the cost of the gas system. So this is the challenge that we face, and HEAT, the organization I work at, got to work on a solution. And we came up with geothermal networks. Talia talked a bit about this, I'm just gonna say very quickly, the idea is the renewable heating and cooling network, so a single system that does both heating and cooling, that uses the stable temperature of the earth, and we're not talking about deep geothermal, we're talking about a few hundred feet under the earth, using pipes to move thermal energy between buildings. The fluid in that pipes is water, and as I hope we get a chance to talk about, it's scalable, meaning you can start with one loop, and then you can add another loop as you have this money and, and resources to build up the system to include more people. What that means is you can have a neighborhood or street by street conversion process. So that the neighbors who were left behind in the previous version of this slide, now that whole top street has electrified. And you can actually potentially decommission the gas line there. So that leaky gas line, you just stop running gas through that line. So not only do you avoid the combusted, the emissions from the combusted gas, you avoid the emissions from the leaked and unaccounted for gas. It's an, and this, is, this makes for equitable decarbonization, meaning that neighbors, and you can, there are different approaches to this, but neighbors share the cost of electrification so that everyone can electrify and decarbonize together. So this is uh, a slide, just I said earlier, we're, we're not talking about the kind of deep Geopower, which you see in the, middle, in the middle, we spoke a little bit about the individual geo-building installs. We're talking about geothermal networks. So why are geothermal networks so efficient? So you see that big sort of office-looking building there. Maybe it's got data servers in it that require cooling. So that building is sending heat in that red arrow into the loop that connects all these buildings. And that's great because the neighbors can take that heat and the red arrows going to their buildings directly from the loop. So you're essentially sharing thermal energy in real time between neighbors. That's a big part of the efficiency. So right, this says networking diverse energy loads allows us to harness otherwise wasted thermal energy. At the moment, the heat from those data servers just gets sent out into the air. This allows it to be captured and reused by neighbors. Over seasons, you can also share energy over time. So you essentially using the earth as a thermal battery. So you can tell from this slide that it's winter. All these buildings are heating. They're pulling heat out of the ground. And then in summer, I think the animation is here, they will, that process will reverse. You'll pull heat out of the buildings and store it in the ground. So again, using the earth as a thermal battery. This is a list of all the goals that he was looking to solve for when we came up with the, the idea of network geothermal. So we wanted to reduce emissions as quickly as possible, and particularly around buildings, because as Talia says, buildings are a huge component of carbon emissions. We wanted to reduce electric grid impacts. We could, I, this is a, maybe a wonky topic, but it, we, I could talk about it for days. Just, as we electrify everything from buildings to heating to stoves to water heating, the demand on our electrical grid is going to grow and grow and grow. And the amount of infrastructure we have to build to meet that need depends so much on how we choose to use our buildings. We want to avoid those stranded assets, the reinvestment in gas pipes. We're very concerned about health and safety. So gas lines, as we read in the news, uh, are a safety concern, and even when they don't leak, they reduce indoor air quality in buildings. The next item is about the equitable transition. So we are really concerned that gas workers have a, 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 few, a workforce transition plan after decades of maintaining infrastructure that we need, and that no neighbors be left behind in this electrification process. It's very important to us that this energy is local. One of the real advantages here is that with a system like this, you're not at the mercy of volatile energy prices. You know, if there's a war somewhere far away, your gas prices on your your geothermal energy prices aren't suddenly going to spike like gas prices do. 
It's also very resilient. Um, in um, uh, Hurricane Umi, is that the name in Texas? One of the only places that didn't lose power, that didn't have burst pipes because they froze, was a development in Texas called Whisper Valley that has a geothermal network. So it's, it's just a very resilient system. This slide just uh, points out that there's a lot of interest from gas utilities across the country. This is <clears throat> um, there's a group at the bottom named the Utility Network Geo Collaborative. This is a group of gas utilities that meet regularly to talk about the opportunity of geothermal networks. This is gas utilities serving around half of all gas customers in the United States. I spoke a little bit about gas workers. This is, on the left you see gas pipes, and on the right you see the water pipes used in a geothermal network. The joke is, they're the same pipes. So the heat vision is that gas workers can spend one week maintaining the integrity of existing gas infrastructure that we're going to need for decades to come, and the next week they can go and install a geothermal loop down the, down the road, and they can keep working. This is what we're looking at in Massachusetts, so I think Arlington is on the map here. This is the Kickstart program that is, is funding its whole set of communities to, to do feasibility studies, and and the map above is pilots that are in various stages of planning and implementation. So Framingham has an operational loop. There are pilots planned in Lowell, Dorchester, and then Heat is actually working on a second loop that would extend that first operational loop in Framingham. Uh, and this is the end of the presentation. We have a QR code that allows you to um, be added to a map of people who would like to have geothermal service. Our website has a lot of resources. We also host a Gas to Geo wiki where anyone can add materials on the Gas to Geo transition. The email address there is my colleague, my wonderful colleague Angie, who currently goes tonight. Um, you can feel free to email her. I'm here and have my card, so you can get my email address also. This is just a bunch of the press that I think has been about Geothermal Networks over the last couple of months. Thank you, so much. Thank you Andrew. All right, so now we're going to zoom in a bit on East Arlington to understand why we're here in this place tonight. So last year, the town became aware of a pilot geo the pilot geothermal projects happening in Framingham and Lowell that Andrew mentioned, and of the opportunity to apply for HEAT's Kickstart grant that Andrew also mentioned. Um, the town has had geothermal on its radar because of the net zero action plan and our goals to transition to clean electricity. And so we applied for the grant to study the feasibility of a network geothermal system to, to study whether we could pilot such a system somewhere here in Arlington. And we got the grant, so that's what's funding us here tonight. We knew we wanted to focus on an area of town with a socioeconomically diverse population for some of the equity reasons that Andrew mentioned. We wanted to focus on a part of town with space for drilling potential bore fields, so a playing field, for example, like going outside, and apply for a grant to study a balance of loads in, in a neighborhood, so a place with a school and homes and small businesses. Um, and in the back room, there's actually an activity you can do this kind of exercise for other parts of Arlington as well to think about where else could this kind of system exist. So some key factors that made this neighborhood a potential fit were the opportunity to lower utility costs for the town and for residents, particularly at the Monogamy Manor development, who pay their utility bills, unlike at some, some other Arlington Housing Authority properties. The large playing field outside is a potential anchor site for boreholes, and it's possible to reseed playing fields after installing a geothermal system. If anybody's passed by the uh, Arlington Historical Society building recently, there is actually a geothermal system under their lawn, um, and they've reseeded, and you can't tap. And importantly, there's an urgent need for cooling right here at Thompson. Um, in the summers, the classrooms, or I guess, at the end of the school year and beginning of the school year, the classrooms uh, here on the second and third floors are extremely hot, and there's uh, the town is actually working right now on an interim solution because this system that we're studying here wouldn't really be in place for, for multiple years, if at all. You know, it's, a, it's just a feasibility study right now. Um, and finally, I was aware of some ongoing retrofit work happening at Menominee Manor, uh, which Jack uh, is actually going to talk about right now to explain how that fits in here. 
No, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jack Nagel, the Executive Director of the Allentown Housing Authority, which is which oversees the Menominee Manor Family Development. Uh, the Menominee Manor Family Development is made up of 179 apartments, which means 179 Arlington families that live at Menominee Manor in our 21 brick buildings, as well as our 25 two and three family houses uh, that exist in this in this map that you can see here. The Allentown Housing Authority was formed in 1948. Through town meeting. Shortly thereafter, construction began on Menominee Manor uh, between 1949 to 1952. The Menominee Manor is, um, is one of the largest state aided family developments in, in the Commonwealth, and it has been preserved with significant ongoing investment, including kitchens and baths, electric service, and handicapped accessible units in 2009, as well as restyling houses in 2013 and the addition of community building in 2016. So that takes us to the Deep Energy Retrofit and the Naughty Manor. So the Allenton Housing Authority, working with UHLC and other uh, state key stakeholders at the, at the Commonwealth, have been looking into ways in which we can re reduce our, our carbon footprint and move towards some of the energy goals um, the state and federal government have. So this project, our Deep Energy Retrofit project, will continue in efforts to preserve this important affordable housing resource while also reducing the carbon footprint and increasing energy efficiency. Due to funding constraints, however, uh, we have phased this project. The first phase will include the replacement of windows at the buildings, as well as building envelope repairs, a uh, key building envelope um, repairs, I should add, uh, to brickwork, parapet, stairwells, uh, the, the replacement of, stair of cellar doors, and more. Um, one important update with that project is we're actually you know, going through the contract, contract execution right now. So the first phase is uh, well underway. Uh, the next phase will include the upgrade of site electrical to meet the needs of the major electrification of gas systems. And, and that will prepare us for the next stage as far as you know, converting our, our gas stoves to, uh, to electric, converse, converting our gas systems, like our hot water systems, our heating system to electric systems, which brings me here today. The Allenton Housing Authority is working with UHLC and the town of Allenton related to electrification options in the manner, which includes uh, geothermal freedom and cooling. We did a study a few years back related to some of the different options, and one of the options identified in that study was geothermal. So obviously I was pretty excited when uh, Talia and the town came and said that they were looking at this grant and different options related to it. In addition to the other upgrades, the planning electrification, as I indicated, uh, could result in more efficiently heated units, the introduction of cooling, and safer cooking areas. Uh, geothermal could also result in reduced energy use and lower utility bills for our residents. EOHLC, through consultation with housing authorities and other key stakeholder groups, has made regulatory updates as well uh, that will result in additional heating deductions for electric heating systems like geothermal air source heat pumps. Um, and this is an important piece because you know what we've seen is you know there could be potential increases in costs uh, from conversion from gas to electric. So the state recognizes that and is um, built in some means in which we can uh, cross that bridge so that it's not going to be a, a huge cost burden on our residents. But that's, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thanks, Jack, for bringing in that context. It's one of the reasons we were interested in this area for all of the opportunities uh, to reduce utility costs, uh, take advantage of this deeper energy retrofit going on. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, all right, I'm going to pass it off to Dave from our consultant at Core. So we brought Core on board after we were awarded uh, the feasibility study grant, and they're exploring uh, some of the technical components of what it might mean to introduce such a system here. Thanks, Tony. So again, my name is Dave Herkinson. I'm an engineer uh, at the Brightcore Energy's geothermal group. Um, Brightcore is an energy conservation measure developer. Uh, our headquarters are out of Armonk, New York. Um, uh, my group specializes in geothermal. Um, we employ about a half dozen professional engineers along with uh, some geothermal scientists um, that are based here in the U.S., also overseas in Scandinavia. And we put a lot of effort into building out this group. Um, our expertise is over 150 years collected with this technology. And we also um, have a construction arm of our business that um, includes about half a dozen drill rigs. Uh, the person that leads that business is actually out of low mass. Uh, she started um, drilling geothermal back in the 90s. So um, I guess collectively we have a great deal of expertise with this technology. 
So I'm going to keep it really brief. I'm kind of here just to be a technical guy who can answer questions. Um, as part of this feasibility study, and this is the feasibility study, it's a thousand foot view that we're, that we're taking at the potential opportunity to install network geothermal uh, in this community. So we're looking top down from surface down to bedrock to get an understanding of the geologic conditions and then through bedrock so we can be able to do a bunch of things. When we are looking at geologic conditions, we're thinking, what well, is the capacity of the ground to be able to either extract energy out of the ground or reject energy into the ground? And how that relates to the loads that are being served by a system. And by loads, I mean thermal loads. Um, we're discussing heating and cooling domestic hot water. These are the loads that can be served by ground stores, heat pumps. Back to sizing the geothermal system that can serve these loads, we need to have a certain idea of where these geothermal boreholes can be installed. And as mentioned before, these are deep boreholes that generally for commercial or large systems range between 200 and 800 feet deep. And the decision on how deep you go has to do with drilling conditions and the amount of capacity that you need and the amount of space that's available. Feasibility-wise, what we start doing literally is putting dots on paper. Where can we install a ground heat exchanger and we end up with an array of dots on paper that get connected with little lines. We end up with borehole locations and pipes. And it's very schematic in this phase. It's really it's conceptual design or schematic design. But that's what we need to, where we need to start to understand if it's possible. And then if it is, what does it cost? What are the magnitude costs to build out the ground heat exchanger side of the system? When we're looking at the loads that are being served, um, that's where we start thinking about again, well, what type of heat pump can retrofit what's already in the building? And how much does it cost to be able to retrofit a typical building of a certain typology, whether it's a residential building, multifamily building, if it's a commercial space? So again, from this thousand foot view, that's the, the puzzle building that, that we're doing during the feasibility study uh, part of the project. We're, we're doing this actively. Uh, I mentioned that we have an office in Scandinavia. They've been installing or designing and utilizing these types of networks for decades now. Um, we're, we're working presently in Washington, D.C., where we're installing a system in the community. But this is a little bit different because most of this uh, is new construction. But this uh, area, Barry Farms in Washington, D.C., was uh, the, the first development of freed slaves uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. It was a very underprivileged community for hundreds of years, uh, for a couple hundred years. Um, and it's getting reconstructed by 80% of it. But we're putting in a, a, a networked geothermal system that's serving multifamily mixed use buildings and uh, townhomes. And it's the first phase of the project, uh, going on the previous slide I mentioned, taking a look at um, potential future expansion of the system. And that was mentioned also during Andrew's uh, a part of the presentation. So when we're going into this, we're really looking at this as if we are developing a new energy system, similar to natural gas. Um, yeah, there is just this, this um, uh, exercise of taking a look at where you start and where you can finish. And with Barry Farms, uh, we're doing about 20% uh, of the community. The plan is to build this out for the next 20 years so that ground source will be the heat source sink uh, for for the domestic hot water heating and cooling needs of this community. And that's what I mean. All right. Thanks to Dave. So we're actually shockingly ahead of schedule. Um, so this is the part where you get to walk around the room, grab some snacks, interact with the posters in the back of the room. Um, there's an opportunity to share your ideas. If this got you thinking about somewhere in Arlington, that's not here, that could be a potential location for a uh, system. You can write down your questions. Um, we'll, as I said, do a verbal Q&A as well, but if you prefer to write your question down, we will select a few of those. Um, there's a little temperature scale to show how you're feeling about network ge geothermal, and then there's a, an activity where you can kind of consider, as I mentioned, what types of things to be looking for in, in such a system. 
And then we'll come back in about 15 minutes uh, for a Q&A session. So thanks for listening to this first part of the program. Um, okay, I'm gonna actually ask all of the folks who spoke to come sit up here to answer questions and we can pass the mic down. Um, oh yes. <laughs> Uh, and actually, if Jeremy Koo from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council could also join us up here. Thanks, Jeremy. Jeremy is the Assistant Director of Clean Energy for MAPC, which is the Regional Planning Agency, and he's kindly agreed to join us up here to answer some questions, as he has a great regional perspective. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to uh, do a mix of questions from you all and, well, I guess verbally, and some of the questions that you already put into the question box, and we'll try to sort them. There are a lot of great questions. We'll try to sort them by topic um, and see how many we can get through in the next roughly 30 minutes. Um, so, one sort of big picture question that I think is great that was asked here is, what are the biggest expected challenges or roadblocks for implementing network geothermal project if I don't know if that's a good question for Andrew or yeah maybe Andrew if you can take that maybe I'll take a sort of first crack at a kind of more above ground kind of policy type of perspective and then David if you want to talk about below ground challenges you know be, be my guest uh, so <clears throat> I mean at the highest level this is a kind of new, the technology is not new, all the, all the component parts of the technology are very well understood, they've been in use for decades. But utility scale network geothermal is a new idea. And so I spend most of my working days talking to people like yourselves to, to get this idea out into the world as part of like trying to help make it real. And you know, I talk to local government leaders and I'll talk to utilities and uh, next week we're hosting a group of utility regulators and I talk to environmental advocates you know all the, and I talk to labor folks we just trained a bunch of geothermal drillers it, it's really it takes because this is new there's a lot that goes into it and all of you know so much of it remains to be built so many people have to kind of get a handle on the idea for it to really sort of work. And that's why, that's why I'm excited to be here with you tonight. I think, to just dig a little bit more, um, there is, for example, questions, the major challenge is essentially around capital expenditure. The big challenge is, you know, Dave can set me straight, is drilling bores and laying pipes. That's expensive, it's big new infrastructure, you've got to do trenching, you've got to do drilling, there is also the, the challenge of building conversion. So in Framingham, one of the big expenses that was anticipated to some extent, but was even larger than was anticipated, which if you've ever done a home renovation, you'll not along with me as I say this, was just you know you go into these buildings that were built in the 40s and 50s and you find asbestos, or you find mold, or you find an and tube wiring. And now that is part of this process of getting ready to install a geothermal network. Not because it is a geothermal network problem, but because we have old housing stock here in Massachusetts and in much of the country. And we haven't come up with a great system for updating our, for doing that deferred maintenance. That's a big challenge. A second one is, okay, let's say you deal with some of that challenge, and you know, Mass A and Mass EC are working on some of this. You still have to drill bores and lay pipes. You have to come up with the, the money for that. The good news is that infrastructure will last for decades. Ground source heat pumps last, depending on who you ask, Mass CDC says 30 years, some people say 35 years. That's already twice the lifespan of air source heat pumps. And the pipes, the bores, and the loop, those will last for many more decades than that. So your operating and maintenance expenditures for way down, lowest of any system. So it's all upfront cost. So the question becomes, how, how, do you, how are you going to foot the bill for that upfront cost? At HEAT, we like to talk about the gas to geo transition. 
because we see this beautiful alignment between the need, the imperative to retire gas infrastructure that leaks a lot, and even when it doesn't leak, emits climate forcing gases, and the ability of gas utilities to do a new thing that is so similar to what they already do, which is put in infrastructure that serves whole neighborhoods, you know, whole street span neighbors regardless of income, and then they make that investment back over decades in rates that we pay as neighbors. And this, the network geothermal is just kind of made for that model. There are lots of other potential ownership and finance models. And you know, Brightcore Dudley works with all sorts of people, universities, big buildings. There's, it's not that gas utilities are the only people that can do this, but for a community, it's it's just it's a ready-made tool. And this is, and we spend a lot of time collaborating with gas utilities on this, but this is a new thing for everyone. And so gas utilities are also learning about this transition. Maybe I'll pause there, so I'll I'm great stuff. <laughs> Actually, you said it right. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, the thing that I guess becomes a, a challenge from constructability, um, actually, Ryan and I were chatting about this, the Arlington High School. Uh, I was involved with a team that, of consultants that took a look at the feasibility of installing geothermal there, and it was adjacent to a site where there was a Napoli spill. So, can we? Can... Yeah. So, it was an old industrial site with plenty of contamination. So, so when you're looking at drilling holes hundreds of feet deep and displacing the material that you're drilling out, you're removing probably uh, about two to three yards, you know, cubic yards of material per borehole. Um, if the soil is contaminated, then you have that much soil contamination to contend with. If the groundwater is contaminated, you could be pulling that groundwater out of the ground, and that has to be managed. So. During the due diligence phase of work, generally, if there's a super fun site, it is something that deems the technology not feasible. Probably that, that's the most challenging part. Other challenging parts, even in areas that are clean, um, sometimes just the geologic conditions are more challenging to install one of these systems than other geologic conditions. Uh, we, we do a good handle of this area and it's, I can't my to say, it's good drilling up here. Um, so, but yeah, you have to do your due diligence when you're taking a look at uh, what's in the ground, what you might disturb. Let's do a question from the audience. Thank you, I'm being light and I'm going to apologize for the two keys guys. Can you talk louder? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll speak better. So I have a couple questions about water. Uh, you mentioned that there's water that is running through the system. Is it just water? Is it antifreeze chemicals? Is it just water? I mean, so the, the Framingham loop, which I can speak about, because we're, um, we're partners on that project, I believe that is, oh gosh, you shouldn't quote me on this, I think that's 25% glycol. And that's for basically two reasons. One is that because this Framingham is the first install of its kind and everyone wants to make absolutely sure that everything goes smoothly, you want to make sure that it won't freeze. There's very little concern about freezing. Once you get about like, you know, five feet down, you're below the frost line, it just it, it won't happen. There are service lines that are shallower than that, so the glycol could help with that, but there's, there's been a lot of care around that. The other reason is like, these pipes are being laid to, to stay there for decades and decades and decades. So you want to make sure that there's no organic growth within those pipes. There's a lot of care taken over flushing the pipes first, but the glycol also helps as a sort of organic inhibitor. But yeah, I, my, my career started as an environmental engineer, and when I started getting involved with these systems, I did a great deal of, I guess, of research myself to understand the circulating fluid, which isn't always water, often it is water with an antifreeze. If the antifreezes and any other chemicals are toxic, um, the antifreeze that's used in commercial systems is propylene glycol. It's a, a type of material. It's, it's used in ice cream. It's um, it, it's a material that is um, 
uh, FDA approved, like it's edible. Now, if you had uh, thousands of gallons of this material dumped at your well, that would be bad. You wouldn't be able to use your well. So it, it's certainly something that is a low risk as far as um, contamination. It's non-toxic. There's also um, materials that are corrosion inhibitors that are also non-toxic materials that are sometimes used in the circulating fluid. Um, so I can speak to that. Um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that putting something in the ground that is is toxic has never been done before. But this industry is very, very careful not to promote technology that is dangerous to the to the health and welfare of residents. And then we just add on that he works um, with folks at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection that because these are what we call closed loop systems, meaning no liquid <coughs> leaves the system in normal operations, right? Like, so they, they could break, they're very stable, but they're, so they're not viewed as water wells by the DEP. The DEP actually sees them as, as a different sort of system. Great, so we got a couple of questions here about how to ensure that all neighbors participate, and I was having a conversation with somebody about this um, in the break as well. How, how do we ensure that there aren't going to be stranded homes? What if somebody doesn't agree to participate in the system? Is this going to be a sort of a tragedy of the commons problem eventually, where many people are sort of using the system at once? Um, that's sort of, a, I guess, a distinct question about kind of what if you're overdrawing the system. But some questions just about kind of how does it work um, when folks are actually asked to participate in a, in a group. But let's start with that first question about how to, how to ensure all, all folks are participating. I mean, I think that's kind of a it's really, I think, a policy question longer term. Like, I think one of the things with um, we're trying to explore with the Framingham pilot is like, you know, okay, this is one approach for the utility to to go go this route. You know, again, even, you know, even this model of like one system connected to many buildings, it's it's all over the place. It's just that usually it's one building owner or one owner of the campus that um, that's doing it. And so, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to within the the sort of like piloting phase. You know, because you know, if the Framingham pilot goes well, the Lowell pilot goes well, there's going to be a lot more utility proposed systems that, that go through. The challenge I think that you're getting, I think, with the, I think really it's a, you know, a distribution or an equity concern is like, and I think what we ultimately would like to get to is, let's say there's a leaky line of pipe in, you know, a certain area, instead of replacing the pipe, let's just retire that entirely and then replace that with the, with the network geo system instead. That, I think, like, you know, I, I, I think you're perfectly frank that we haven't, we're in un kind of uncharted territory from a policy perspective. Um, but I well, I'll jump a little bit. This is, again, one of those things that I could talk about, I think about a lot and could talk about a lot. What you're essentially talking about is what is called in, in the kind of regulating world the obligation to serve, which is the provision in the law that says that if you build a home in a gas company's territory, the gas company has to provide you with gas service. They also can't withdraw gas service. So the challenge that Jeremy is talking about is, let's say, you know, you build a loop that, and, and a neighbor says, I don't want you to thermal service, I want gas service. So in Framingham, because it's a demonstration project, there is an agreement that the project, the demonstration project will run for two years, and at the end of two years, if anyone wants to be put back on the gas system, they will flip it back to the gas system. So the gas infrastructure is left in place. Again, this is just for sort of demonstration purposes. Is it going to work? How are people going to like it? It's required to have people make the jump to be the very first. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion in the Massachusetts legislature around future of gas. The Department of Public Utilities has an entire future of gas docket. You can look it up. It's wonderful bedtime reading. One of the key things that is being discussed in a, as, as a necessary policy reform as part of the future of gas is reforming the obligation to serve. This has actually been done in Washington State. That Washington State has reformed the obligation to serve so that gas companies can meet their obligation to serve with thermal energy. That is written into their statutes. And all I would say is, I would, if, and if you're in touch with your local legislators, I would encourage you to raise this issue with them because it is very much a live issue in Massachusetts right now. Great. Let's take another question from the audience over there. Hi, Claudia. Um, I, just to piggyback on Sam, and I have three love what the brain is left. So, just to, to 
add to what you were saying, in Framingham you were having this, you know, this project where, as a, I presume, as a, as a way to kind of bring assurance that you were leaving the infrastructure in place. Is that kind of the model that you intend to use going forward? Because it does kind of follow any kind of psychological fears that may, you know, like, oh, well, I still have this as a reserve if I don't like this. I mean, is that an approach that is being looked at policy wise? I mean, I, don't, I, I think we're I think we're pretty far out from that point of like making that decision. I think the Framingham system, the site they chose, they couldn't have switched off the gas, the gas line there if they wanted to because it was serving an area that went beyond there. I think longer term, we'd like to see it as an alternative to, you know, new developments or replacing a you know a gas main that goes to particular areas. These sorts of things will need a lot more proactive planning. Uh, you know, we're. We're, we're really at the very early stages of this. You, you said in that doc, doc in, you know, the order they issued in December, if this pilot goes well, they'll start, issue, you know, they'll start you know, approving more of those. But you know, now you're talking, you know, I think the, the pilot was first filed for by was what, December 2019 or something, is that great case? So it's like, these are, these are, these are many years out, and I think. Um, so we've had some complications in the meantime. Yeah, <laughs> just, just some, some little weird thing happened. Yeah, a little weird thing. But, yeah. uh, you know, I think there, there's, there's a lot of opportunities that look at what the implications are. I think longer term, because, you know, uh, as Andrew's saying, you know, we have we don't want to be putting gas pipes in the ground that we're still paying off, you know, 40, 50 years from now and we'd like to transition off of that system. We'd like to see that as a, as a longer term alternative than just simply replacing uh, gas entirely. But I think to your point, with, you know, it's, you know, while it's a technology that's been around for decades, it's not one that's as familiar uh, for folks. But I think once once they're more familiar with it, and you know, it becomes much more of a, you know, do the work inside the house, plug it in, and, and you're just, you know, just getting heated and cool. I think in the same way, it's, it's taken years to get to, I think, comfort with things like, you know, maybe split heat pumps and things like that. You know, there will be a little bit of a, a curve. And just to piggyback on that, I think, you know, the people talk about this, the neighbor effect, right? Like, you don't want to be the very first person you know to get an electric vehicle. What if they're terrible? But once your neighbor has an electric vehicle and they like it, you're like, well, it just seems like that's okay. And I think we're at, as Jeremy's saying, we're at this inflection point. And, and you can already go to the building in BU that runs on geothermal systems. There's, there's, there's more and more of them. But I think once the, you know, the, the Framingham demonstration project is really important because I think for us to be able, all of us to be able to see that it works, I personally care that my family is warm. I, you know, and I'd love to avoid a climate catastrophe, but I don't care beyond that exactly what the mechanics are going on behind the, behind the system. I just care that my family is warm. And I think once we can look out in the world and see with some confidence that people are happy with their heating and cooling systems, it will all just be kind of uninteresting. <laughs> There is some mention in there of, of sort of rough time frames, and we got a couple of questions about the timing of, of this the project, of this study, and I just wanted to address that since we touched on the Framingham time frame. So I think the short answer is we don't exactly know at this point. We know that the feasibility study itself is going to wrap up in about February or March of next year, and at that point we'll know a little bit more about the geology of the area, what kind of system might make sense for this area, the sizing of it, the loads that will be on that system. Um, and beyond that, we, we don't really know. I think there's a big question about funding. These feasibility studies have been funded by the utilities, but if this project were not to be one of the pilot projects, there would have to be another way to fund it. And if the utility weren't going to pay for the whole thing as they are for these feasibility, or for the pilot projects, then we're in a situation where we need to figure out how to fund such a, a system. So there are some big questions about ownership structure, about funding that are unresolved at this point, and I think those remain to be seen, and, and we're thinking about kind of what the next step of, of studying could be for this project. And maybe, maybe it's not a network, maybe it won't be feasible here, maybe it's something just a monotony matter, or it's just for the Thompson School, or we determine that the, this lo location is not the best fit. So we're really, I just want to emphasize that we're really in an exploratory phase right now. And this like this is the first public engagement that we're doing around this to, to sort of see what people are thinking about it. So just wanted to provide that perspective of, of kind of the time scale we're thinking about and, and the uncertainties at this point for this kind of a system. Um, but let's, yeah, let's take a couple questions from the audience here. So what, what the... Well, yeah, let's give you a mic just so also we have ACMI filming it so they can take it up. 
Let me stand up. Uh, oh, well, I, I think a lot of people are probably wondering about what the cost is. I realize that a utility funds it, it's different. But let's say a utility is out. And I, I understand because especially as a network system, there's going to be some requirements of size before it makes financial sense. Are, are there any ballpark numbers that I, I'm thinking there must have been some thought about? You need at least, I don't know, a whole block to do it for it to make sense, or like what? And then there was a whole block of, I don't know, 20 houses. I'm just throwing a number out. I don't even know what the numbers are. So it's gonna be like $20,000 a house. And what, what does it even look like? What do we, I'll give you a great it depends answer. Uh, but, I mean, but you know, there, there's, I, I think, you know, in terms of like, I, I don't necessarily think that it's, you know, in terms of like the, you know, design, building a network and then, you know, upsizing or whatnot, it, it, it doesn't necessarily, I think, depend on like, you have to get a certain number of buildings. I mean, you can, there's like a, a few dozen house, you know, individual residences in Arlington that have systems just serving their own homes. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, you need to get to a certain amount. I mean. If we get to a longer term, you know, thing with with that Tali was talking about, where it becomes a core part of what the utilities are are doing, you know, they're happy to add any you know amount to their rate base and, and and keep you know and keep expanding like you know their their you know their network of assets. So, um, you know, an individual house right now, you know, before incentives could be anywhere from you know forty to sixty thousand or so. Um, when you start scaling up it can vary quite a bit because I think one of the things that was talked about here was the balancing impact of some of these systems. If you have, you know, a lab building or a supermarket or something that's like always, always going to need some degree of cooling, you're reducing the amount of heat that you need, the amount of like drilling that you need to do on a per, per building basis because you just don't need to drill, you know, draw as much heat in the in the winter because somebody else is putting heat back into, into the system. So there can be some efficiencies there. And I, I think there's one of the earliest questions was, you know, what, um, you know, what are some of the challenges? One of those is really just picking the right sites and the right sequencing to, you know, to approach. You know, there's, there's, a, you know, I, I, you know, the agency I work for serves the 101 communities of Greater Boston. You know, I, there's a, you know, a dozen others that are excited about this technology and what it could offer. How does you, you know, how does every source or grid figure out, like, you know, where which sites do you go with first and what end up being the most promising and that, you know, to to Point about right to serve. If there's something that succeeds that, how do you then balance the you know you know the right that folks would have to have access to a system like this, even if it might be in a suboptimal or more expensive place to, to go. But you know, same sort of thing with gas connections happen all the time. It's you know depending on you know if you if you if you wanted to you know convert to gas and needed to you know get a gas connection, like so those costs will vary quite a bit as well. Thanks, Jeremy. I just want to, there, was a, there were a couple questions here, we only have a few minutes left, but we had a, a few questions expressing um, some concern about the, and I think this is a, a challenge across Massachusetts, we have a very, we have a very old building stock, um, and how do we ensure that first we're addressing issues um, uh, around insulation and, and some of the health concerns you talked about, asbestos or, or other sorts of basic, uh, you know, the condition of the housing, and maybe Jackie could speak a little bit to this at Monogamy Matter, but then perhaps other folks can provide kind of that regional perspective on how we're managing um, that, that aspect of this transition and the reality of our older building stock. Well, I can speak to, you know, one of the goals of, of you know, UHLC is looking at the sustainability and other options that you know, not only address those types of concerns, whether it's, you know, a, a, you know a hot a heat community, like a heat area, high heat area, or what have you, flooding zone. Uh, but and these are all things that get taken into consideration when we're looking at our developments and some of the different preservation work that we do. You know, we also it, it creates opportunities for us to identify and, and seek funding from whether it's EOHLC itself, the town, or other funding sources related to completing that work, which in many cases will result in another monetization and um, and capital improvements related to the housing stock. You know, when we talk about Monogamy Manor, we talk about buildings that were built between 1949 and 1952. There have been some substantial projects that have happened over time to try to preserve that, that housing stock. Um, but, you know, there continue to be, you know, needs related to that housing given that it's approaching 100 years old, you know, in the next, you know, couple of decades. So we're, we're trying to address that. We're trying to address that, you know, not only to preserve this important affordable housing stock, but also to address some of these concerns related to sustainability, 
um, energy efficiency decarbonization. You know, and that you know that comes from everything from you know the windows that we're looking at replacing, the way that we replace them, you know, building envelope repairs um, to not only ensure that the buildings continue to be able to be used, but also uh, to potentially look at options in which we can create additional insulation that will reduce um, loss of energy. Uh, so I mean, I think you know one of the goals and one of the reasons why you know EOHLC and, and Arlington Housing Authority and other housing authorities across the state. I mean, one housing authority that was mentioned, you know. Kind of passing is Framingham Housing Authority, which is a partner in one of the sites in that Framingham site, I believe. So, I mean, I think it's it's when we are presented with options like this to look at it, even from a feasibility standpoint, we have to look at it because it could be an option that could help preserve this affordable housing stock and while also meeting other um, other state and local goals. So, I want to recognize that it is 8:30. Um, maybe we'll let Jeremy or whoever was going to run just kind of the regional perspective say the last word and then I can wrap us up here. Thanks for staying a couple of minutes extra. Yeah, I mean, I think just bigger picture, you know, DPU has indicated, you know, multiple times, not just in the future of gas output, but in other places that they, you know, they see, they still see an efficiency first approach to electrification. And, you know, I think, um, you know, if you, you know, if you want to say that, you, if you do, you can put in, Five thousand dollars of efficiency work to put in, you know, fi you know, fifteen thousand less of heat pump. Great, you know, this it's better for the it's better for the system. It's better for the peak load. It's better for better for comfort in general. And so, my expectation would be that, especially if it comes to the utilities, and they also have these targets to mass save that they have to hit simultaneously with doing efficiency work and also, you know, figuring out how to how to bring these you know bring network geo to these to these uh, to these homes. And I, I think that. At least from the you know where there aren't necessarily like remediation issues, which is a, is an issue that they're having they're they're having some challenges with, but I think they've been able to start providing incentives for for folks that are low and moderate income uh, to to remediate so that they can get the efficiency work done. I think that that's sort of the sort of thing that they'll start looking at you know wrapping into it. But it's a big uh, it's a big bigger picture like question like what can actually what can they put onto the cost of these and then you know spread out over the you know. 30, 40 years, um, and that, for that, I think we're still in, in some untested waters. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm cognizant that we did not answer everybody's questions, and they were really great questions, so we'll do our best to share as much information to answer your questions as possible, and you can always reach out to me uh, with specific questions. I'll share, share my email on the screen and on the last slide. So just to give a snapshot of sort of where we've been and where we're headed with this particular study, we began this work with uh, the, the awarding of the heat, heat grant early in this year and contracted with Raycor and we're sort of doing some engagement throughout the summer with uh, our Electrify Arlington Fair and the National Night Out event. We were at Town Day, we're having this event today. We're having an event um, on November 12th. It's an Arlington Community Education cl class that's focused on geothermal systems for your home. So there were a couple questions about um, individual home systems and sort of what advice would we give to residents considering the transition? Is it, is it worth it? Um, should we wait for a network? And I would say come to that class and you'll, uh, you'll get some questions answered there. Um, and then we'll be wrapping up the uh, feasibility study with the technical analysis and final cost estimate um, early into next year. And then we, we plan to complete and share our final report by about March or April. And that's, uh, that's sort of the plan right now. And beyond that, as I said earlier, we're, we're not sure at this point. Um, we hope to take some of the ideas here tonight and think about what next steps could mean based on what everybody is thinking uh, in the community. And we will explore what options we have based on what the feasibility study says. So that's all we have tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. Thanks to our presenters and uh, thanks to everyone for questions. And please reach out to me if you have uh, questions that were not answered. And have a great night. Thanks. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.